Hello everybody, and welcome back to Creation Myths, where we expose bad creationist arguments for the bad creationist arguments that they are. Today's creation myth is the claim that there are no truly beneficial mutations. Is this true? No, no it is not. A bit of background here. When we say a novel beneficial trait, we mean a trait that confers a fitness advantage and is new in the organism that experiences it. There are a bunch of different mechanisms that allow an organism to acquire a new beneficial trait. It can be something as simple as a point mutation. One base changes to another, and you get a new beneficial trait. It could also be a gene duplication and neo-functionalization. That's when you have one gene, it duplicates, and then one of them changes and acquires a new function. You can also have exaptation, which is when a structure or feature does one thing, and then it acquires the ability to do a different thing. So for example, feathers were originally for thermoregulation, and then through exaptation, they came to be used for flight. You can also have frame shift mutations. This is where the reading frame of a gene changes. We see an example of this in the mitochondrial genome. And then of course, there's horizontal gene transfer, where genetic information moves horizontally from individual to individual, rather than from vertically from parent to offspring. Lots of new traits are associated with horizontal gene transfer. For example, it is a common feature associated with endosymbiosis. This is not an exhaustive list of the mechanisms associated with the acquisition of novel beneficial traits, but it's a pretty decent list to get us started. The creationist argument here is that all beneficial or novel traits and or functions are due to a loss of function, a loss of information, or some other loss within the genome. There are a number of different forms of this argument. The version that I've laid out here is the strongest form of this argument. There are weaker forms of it that say, well, most new traits are associated with a loss, or most new traits are not associated with anything new, or they have a cost, or whatever. But I'm making the strongest form of the argument here, and lest creationists cry straw man, straw man, let me show you some examples of creationists making this exact argument. By the way, I will link to the videos that I took these screen captures from in the description so you can find the full videos there if you want. So here's one. All point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. Not one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Mutations only observed to decrease genetic information can be beneficial in a specific environment. Mutations lead to decrease in overall fitness of organism. One more, because it's crystal clear, beneficial mutations do not exist. Beneficial outcomes of mutations in specific environments do exist. Mutations only alter current genetic information, never observed to add genetic information. And I'll note that those last two are from Dr. Georgia Purdom, who has a PhD, she is a geneticist, she knows better, and she's just lying when she says stuff like that. This particular creationist claim is trivially easy to refute. All we need are some examples of mutations that are beneficial, that don't have a downside, and that add some kind of function or information without a corresponding loss of function or information. And that's really easy to find. I'm going to give you two examples of such a mutation. The first is HIV-1 group M VPU. So VPU is a protein found in HIV and the related SIVs. Its ancestral function is to degrade a protein called CD4. It doesn't matter what that does or means for the context of this video. Just know that in all of the SIVs and HIV-1, uh, VPU maintains CD4 degradation. That's its ancestral function and it continues to do that. VPU's new function is called tethrin antagonism. It does this because the human immune system and other primate immune systems have a protein called tetherin. Now, the various SIVs use different proteins to deal with tetherin, but HIV-1 group M uses VPU to do it, and it does it through a completely new mechanism, which you can see on the right right here. There are at least four specific amino acid interactions between VPU and tetherin that are required, so you need four new mutations at least in order for this interaction to occur. That confers tetherin antagonism. That same HIV-1 group M VPU has the ancestral function of degrading CD4. It hasn't lost anything, but it has gained a completely new biochemical function. Creationists sometimes claim that this is just an example of VPU recovering an ancestral trait. Other VPUs can antagonize tetherin, so this one's no different, just going backwards to that ancestral trait. Uh, but nope, that's not the case. In the SIVs, a protein called NEF or this VPU protein antagonize tetherin. Different SIVs differ in terms of the specific mechanism. 
But the important thing is that HIV VPU uses a completely different mechanism for tethering antagonism compared to anything else that exists among the SIVs. And this is required because human tethering is different from all of the other ape tetherins. This quote from Kluge 2014 explains what's going on here. However, the human tetherin gene contains a deletion that removes five amino acids from its cytoplasmic domain and confers resistance to SIV NAF proteins. It is currently believed that this presents a barrier to successful spread of SIV among humans, which can only be overcome by switching from NEF to other viral antagonists. Indeed, during adaptation to humans, HIV-1 group M and, less effectively, N viruses evolved the ability to utilize another viral protein, VPU, to counteract tetherin. So it's not only that VPU is doing a different function from what it normally does, it's doing that function in a completely new way compared to all of the other things that do that function because the other things that do that function, the SIV, NEF, and VPUs, do it using part of the tetherin protein that is missing from humans. So this is definitely 100% a new trait due to mutations with zero loss of function of fitness of anything associated with it. Our second example comes from humans and its lactase persistence. Now, creationists love to claim that the ability to digest lactose, sure, it's beneficial, but it's due to a broken regulatory mechanism. Basically, normally, at the end of childhood, we would turn off our lactase genes, but in, a, in people who have lactase persistence, those regulatory mechanisms are broken, and those genes stay on throughout adulthood. Here's an example of this claim being made by Dr. Kevin Anderson. He's claiming here that within the human genome, you have the lactase gene, and just upstream of that, you have a gene called MCM6. And he's claiming that MCM6 codes for a repressor protein, a protein that turns genes off. He's claiming that MCM6 codes for a lactase repressor. So in childhood, the lactase gene is active, but in adulthood, that MCM6 gene is being expressed and the repressor protein is blocking the lactase gene. But in the case of lactase persistence, there's a mutation that inactivates MCM6, disabling the ability to repress lactase, and therefore that gene stays active throughout adulthood. Now this is completely wrong. This is just not true. MCM6 does not code for a repressor. It codes for a helicase subunit, and helicase is an enzyme that's involved in DNA replication. The MCM6 gene has nothing to do with lactase repression. And I will say that this is not a secret. You know how I learned that MCM6 has nothing to do with lactase repression and that it codes for helicase subunit? I googled it and the first thing that comes up is like the, the gene kind of reference page for MCM6 from the Human Genome Project that's on like GenBank or something. And it just tells you straight up what it does. And it doesn't make a repressor, it makes a helicase subunit. The actual mechanism of lactase persistence does not involve any loss of regulation at all. Basically the way this works is that there is a low affinity lactase enhancer within the MCM6 gene. This is a site, an enhancer is a site that transcription factors bind to, and when they do so, it increases the expression of the associated gene. So within that MCM6 gene upstream, you have an enhancer, and when transcription factors bind to it, it increases the expression of the nearby lactase gene. Now this is a low affinity enhancer. It doesn't very efficiently attract those transcription factors. When you're young, that's not a problem because your other metabolic pathways are not all that active. So there's no competition for those transcription factors with other genes. So during childhood, you get lots of lactase expression. Now, typically in adulthood, as other metabolic pathways come online, you have stiff competition for transcription factors with those other genes, so they end up being expressed a lot, but this low affinity lactase enhancer loses out, so you don't have lactase expression as an adult. In the case of lactase persistence, there are mutations, and there are two main mutations that are documented to do this. There are mutations within that enhancer that increase the affinity of that enhancer for transcription factors which means during adulthood, you're able to maintain high levels of lactase expression, even in the face of competition for transcription factors from other genes. Now I should note here, there's no numbers associated with these graphs. They're just schematic designed to show you the relationships. They're not actually showing actual uh, like numbers in terms of expression levels. It's just relative levels to show you the, the pattern that we're seeing. An important thing to note here is that this higher lactase expression in the case of lactase persistence is not associated with any loss of regulation. There are no changes to one's ability to turn that gene off. All you're doing is increasing the affinity of an enhancer 
which increases its ability to compete for transcription factors with other genes. There's no broken regulatory mechanism involved in that trait. So to summarize, creationists claim that there are no truly beneficial mutations, that all beneficial changes must involve a loss of function, regulation, information, something. This is completely false. We have known examples of mutations that confer novel beneficial traits with no such loss. So, the creationists claim that there are no truly beneficial mutations? That is a myth. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Don't get fooled.